we've talked about how, a how, little bit about background on transportation networks. Now, as industrial engineers, we oftentimes want to know how to improve things. So what can you do to improve a transportation network? Well, one is you can improve the cube of the truck, right? You can pack it better, you can stack it better, you can get better packaging. Another is you can reduce the frequency. So if I'm sending five trucks per week, each one half full, I can reduce that maybe to two or three trucks per week full. Does that make sense? And another big way to improve a transportation network is just changing the mode. Like if I switch from LTL to multi-stop truckload, I'm going to save a lot of money. Likewise, if I avoid premium, I'm going to save a lot of money. Where you get in real trouble with transportation is when you start running premium. So let's say I really want to ship it by ocean container, but I've wasted too much time and I have to fly it. It's going to be a order of magnitude difference in cost. Does everybody kind of get that? So how do I improve my packaging? Well, the items have what they call a primary packaging, which is what the, how the item is packed, typically a pallet. And then secondary packaging, which are the packages that are packed on, on the pallet, right? And secondary packaging should be designed to minimize transportation cost and optimize the space. Um, stackability re restrictions should be questioned. So if somebody says, I can't stack this on top of this, you got to ask why, right? Now, there are many tools, and the, the, the tool shown is MaxLoad, that are used to, to do cube improvement. And, and so what we need to know is um, how to calculate cube. And to compute cube, one must know the dimensions of the primary and secondary packages, um, as well as the items to be shipped. Once the dimensions are known, you can make what they call a load diagram of the, the freight, right? And then these are ideal loadings, and they should be compared to what actually people are doing out on the dock. And that's where you get into a lot of trouble. Maybe they're not stacking the truck according to the way they should. And you also want to make sure that stackability and vertical space restrictions are included. And for research purposes, this is a 3D, inter or 3D um, bin packing problem is an integer programming problem. So one of the, we, we mentioned before the drop deck, right? And that's a bad drop deck trailer and a regular trailer. And this is 130 and that's 100 and this is 110 and they're both 53 feet long, right? So if I have a, an item that's 65 inches high, which trailer do I want? You know, for the 130, you can put them too right. high. Right, I can put them too high. And then I'll only have... Uh, You'll max right out. Yeah, I'll max right out. Uh, let's say it's 64 inches high. Probably would not get away with that. Now, if I try to do that in the 110, I'll only be able to stack them one high. And so this one will hold about twice as much, excluding what's in the nose. Okay? And there are lots of opportunities for stacking and packing. We'll, we'll, we'll work some examples next time. Frequency is easy. We want to ship in full trucks, full containers. So don't ship five trucks per week, one a day at 80%, but instead ship a full truck Monday through Thursday and cut out Friday's shipment. So use inventory to reduce the shipment. Make sense? Um, frequency can also help with LTL. LTL prices are, get cheaper as you ship more, more, more amount. Um, the trade-off between frequency is that the, more, the, the lower the frequency, the higher the inventory. Mode is huge. If you, can, if you can do it, you want to ship in the cheapest mode possible. Okay, take into account inventory considerations, etc. So if I can ship, switch from truck to rail, 
you're going to save about a third to a half. If I can switch from LTL to multi-stop truckload, you're going to save 70 or 80 percent. Okay? Big savings. Um, if you can get rid of air and ship it ground, you're going to save a lot. And if you change mode from high cost mode to low cost mode, it's a great opportunity. Of course, when I ship change modes, it's going to do what? It's going to change the time required to get the item from point A to point B, which, which may be important. You can also improve your network by truck routing. And the simplest type of vehicle routing problem is where you have a capacitated vehicle and a bunch of customers that must be serviced by a single depot. And so each truck has a limited capacity. There are many heuristics for the vehicle product, the vehicle routing problem. Good software exists, um, you know, and, you know, really the critical thing is that, that, that your schedulers plus the software need to work well together. You need a good understanding of your tariffs. And basically all the vehicle routing problem is, is I have a bunch of locations that I need to pick up or deliver to you. And I have to get the truck from the plant to cover all the locations. And you want to do that in a minimum amount of cost or time, depending on your, your metric of concern. Many practical considerations exist for the vehicle routing problem. And this is the Coke paper that you guys are going to read. So bring the Coke paper next time and we'll talk about it. You're going to have possibly time windows at, at pickup and delivery, right? So the customer says, you can only come between these hours. You'll have uh, hours of service limits on the driver. He can only work so he or she can only work so many hours. You have uh, capacity restrictions on the vehicle, weight, linear, and cube, and then load and unload times. You also have vehicle types, um, split deliveries, and uncertainty, uh, which is which is important to understand uh, because you know if somebody puts an extra pallet on the truck and you no longer can fit enough pallets, that uncertainty leads you to some design. Let me talk briefly what linear is, because most of you probably have never heard that term. If I have a truck, especially true of LTL, you can measure the space in a truck in terms of the weight, how many pounds it can hold, right? Weight. You can measure it in terms of cube, which is the number of cubic feet. But you can't use all the cubic feet, right? Another way to measure it is linear, which is percent of truck. And you can measure linear in terms of floor space used or in terms of just linear in the truck. Because what you do with LTL is you'll fill up the first load and then you'll put a divider in. And then you'll pull up the second load, put a divider. So it's how, many, how much of the truck in this space is used by the cargo from this supplier, right? Everybody get linear? Now, I mean, the, these are very simple concepts. Transportation's not hard, right? It's an operational activity, though. And any, any of you who've worked in operations, if you ever worked with operations, can, can attest that you have to have good designs, but you also need good execution. And you need to constantly be answering the question, what happens if somebody puts an extra pallet on my truck? Can it, can it, what, what will happen? Um, you know, we, we designed all the inbound material to, to GM plants, and we would always run the trucks a little bit less than full for that very reason. What happens if people want more of this option this week? Well, we'd either have to add a truck or design a little bit full, which leads me to my next point. Transportation plans can either be done based on an operating plan or unplanned. If you have an assembly plan, it might just be best to do the same thing every day in an operating plan mentality. So every day the truck will go from this point to this point and then on into the plant. If, if you're, or if you're a retailer like Walmart, every day the truck will go and visit these sites. And even in the Coke paper, it's a planned schedule. Um, now, other networks, everything changes. UPS doesn't know who they're going to deliver to today in Beaumont. 
So every day their, their, their plan will change in terms of the addresses. Um, and so you can either operate it off a plan or not a plan. If you have a plan, for shippers it gives them a consistency. Sometimes you can get better prices. All an operating plan is is a list of planned routes and carriers to service the routes. Um, the plan can be used for budgeting, and it can also be used to bid and get carriers. Um, and then you manage your business based on deviations from the plan. If you want to change an operating plan, you really need to build a business case, collect the requirements, say here's my old plan, here's my new plan, get approvals, um, get actual rates, and then change the plan. Almost all vendors today will provide what they call track and trace capability. Um, so you can log on to a web page and see where your freight is, which is nice, just like UPS. Um, you can also ex establish EDI and EDI-like relationships where they send automatic updates to your transportation system. So I can know at all times where my freight is. And this is wonderful. An important concept is, is the concept of an INCO term. And an INCO term is an internationally accepted commercial term to define the roles of the buyer and the seller in the arrangement for transportation and responsibilities. INCO term specifies when the ownership of merchandise takes place. It, these terms are typically provided in the contract for, for procurement is written. So if, 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 if I'm moving parts internationally, so I'm trying to buy uh, seats from China or uh, metal parts from India, okay, or Europe or wherever. And so I have a supplier and my plant's over here. Where does the transfer of ownership occur? It could occur at the supplier, I come and pick it up, or it could occur next to my plant and he delivers it to me. Does this make sense to everybody? Inco terms specify that. So the first Inco term is X works, which basically means the title and risk passes to the buyer, including payment of all transportation insurance from the seller's door, used for any mode of transportation. So if I buy something from you, X works, it means I buy it from your dock, and I am fully responsible for getting it to my place. Okay. And then you have things like FAC, which is the title and risk passes uh, when the seller delivers the goods cleared for export to the carrier. Um, so the seller's free alongside ship. They deliver it to the port, free on board. They get it on the ship. Uh, cost and freight. The title, risk, and insurance pass to the buyer when delivered on board the ship of the, by the seller who pays for the transportation cost to the destination port. Then CIF, cost insurance freight, they also pick up the insurance while it's on board the ship. And then we keep going and we keep going all the way to DDP, delivery duty paid. Title and risk pass to the buyer when the seller delivers the goods to a named destination point cleared for import. Transportation's covered. If you have questions about INCO terms, ask your purchasing department. They're incredibly important, right? Because if I'm looking at a supplier and they give me a price of $3 per part, well, it, it, if I have to pick it up, it may cost me $3.50, right? So it's a big difference in the price of parts. One doesn't want to say the wrong thing when you're talking about a contract. So if you're using INCO terms, make sure you're using them properly. People mess them up all the time. <clears throat> They're very confusing to people. They're confusing to me. So talk to your purchasing department. Vocabulary for the shipper is the person who ships the freight, the origin, the destination. The consignee is the en entity that receives the freight, and the paying party is the one who pays for freight. Many companies today use what they call third-party logistics providers. These are companies responsible for managing the transportation for another company. Some have assets, some do not. UPS, FedEx, Excel, DHL, Penske, Ryder, 
APL all have significant 3PLs or function like a 3PL. The exact relationship between a 3PL is engagement specific, but often includes managing tariffs, match pay, booking, providing paperwork, track and trace, monitoring, and customs clearance for international shipments, okay? So basically, a 3PL, I don't want to manage transportation. I make um, valves, okay? I don't want to deal with transportation. So I say, you, UPS, I handles all my transportation. I just tell you where to move things, and you tell me the price. And so UPS, of course, goes, for sure, we'll be glad to handle the business. And they make money a couple of different ways. One, they may charge you a management fee. Two, the tariff that they charge, the, the accounts receivable tariff and the accounts payable tariff may have a difference. Correct? Three, they could consolidate your freight. Um, so, I mean, that, there are lots of ways they can make money. But what are, you, what are you essentially saying? They're smarter at it than I am. And even if they make a good margin, it'll still be cheaper for me. May or may not be true, correct? So I want you to read the Coke paper. And um, we'll discuss that next time. So for next lecture, um, we'll, we'll discuss the Coke paper. And we'll talk about procurement, OK? Any questions? Well, you know, transportation is a great area, lots of opportunity. Um, you know, if you get involved in the field, it's a fun field. Um, always something interesting.